Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Messianic Bible Study with me. Unfortunately, I do not have any guests today, so uh, we'll have to make do with just little old me. Today we're continuing in the myth of Jacob. <clears throat> and we're starting in Genesis 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get this girl for me for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to, uh, to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to his father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to her, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for, to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem, and the young man did not delay to do the thing, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let us dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us, to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of, the, of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their livestock, their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in their houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I will be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? And that is the end of that little vignette of a story in the myth of Jacob. Now, a couple things are interesting here. First of all, Dina is the daughter of Leah, and Simeon and Levi are also both sons of Leah. And so, classically, people, when they're commenting on this, they'll talk about how the 
the sort of family dynamics play out. Um, Leah being the unloved wife, naturally the, uh, and then you have Joseph later being the loved son, the favored son out of all of the other sons. Naturally, you'll have some sort of like a competition going between the sons of Rachel and the sons of Leah. And naturally, the sons of Leah will feel passed over or just in general bitter because of the overall nature of the relationship between Leah and Jacob and Rachel. I mean, it's their mother. Of course, you're, you're going to want to defend your mother. And if your father is not that great to your mother and he is great to some other woman, then, you know, some other woman, it's his other wife, then you're still going to feel angry not only with uh, the whole situation but with your father and so now their sister Dina is defiled in whatever way violated in whatever way it it has happened and of course they're going to be very upset uh, by this and then Jacob the father uh, of Dina and also the husband of the unloved wife who is the mother of Dina is and of course is their mother as well is not doing anything about it he's sort of acting flagrantly about it so to speak or or perhaps there's a feeling that if it were the daughter of Rachel he would be much more uh much much more up in arms much more aggressive. And so, you know, maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't, but that feeling is there for the other sons. And so they feel much more protective of Dina than, of course, they might have if Jacob uh, was generally not seen as suspicious in this area. Like, perhaps if he always treated Leah with the respect that she deserved, always treated her sons with the love of the firstborn sons and her children, like Dina, with the amount of love that he showed Rachel's children, then maybe when he was hesitant to be violent with Shechem, maybe they would have respected that a bit more. But they just see this as another uh, another set another action in the set of behaviors that demonstrate and prove that he is favorable towards Rachel and not to Leah and towards Rachel's children and not to Leah's children. And so that's what commentators, when they talk about this story, that's sort of the background that they give it. Now, of course, uh, she went out to see the women of the land. This, so what happens is Jacob, they move in this area. They're Shechem adjacent. They're over here and and Shechem is over here. And uh, they're probably in like in the same way that they did with Abimelech and uh, well what Isaac did with Abimelech and Abraham with with Egypt and Abimelech. Most likely they are dwelling in the land that's owned by Shechem. They're sojourning. And they're just passing through. They're sort of living a Bedouin lifestyle here in tents while Shechem is in a city. And so this is an interesting statement. She went out to see the women of the land. Now, people generally fall on one side or another with this statement. Either they're trying to uh, condemn Dina or they're trying to excuse Dina, her actions. Now, you might read that and say, well, it's just you're going out to see the city. But understand that these are foreigners. These are uncircumcised. They're heathen. They're pagan. They're, they're, they're not following the gods that you follow, first of all. Second of all, they live in a city. And if you look into the history of Shechem at this point and just what the Bible talks about of Shechem, it seems to be sort of like the capital of Canaan, if it could have some sort of capital to speak of, because Canaan is generally uh, seen as a no man's land by the uh, Egyptian Hitt- the Egyptians and Hittites, who 
look at it as but like they're the more civilized uh nations and canaan is not canaan it would be like how seattle or new york views some rural montana village or something like that's the disparity between the two and so when you look at shechem it's like the biggest guy in town he's the biggest guy in town but that's not saying much. There is this loose confederacy, or perhaps Shechem is just powerful enough to have forced all the other sit, uh, surrounding city-states into submission, that that it has become the more or less the capital. So, nat so naturally, Jacob, not wanting to go into a foreign land again, he just got back into the land of Canaan, his promised land, um, naturally, he doesn't want to leave, so he wants to go to the most civilized part of this no man's land. And again, he just lived 20 years in a merchant, um, uh, a, the crossroads of the merchants of civilization between Babylon, the, the Assyrians, Hittites, and the Egyptians. So naturally... Haran, Padanaram, is not going to be a terrible place to stay. It's probably more civilized. He's going from that city, state, down to this rural area. So, Dina, she wants to go and hang out with all these pagans, these heathens. My thought is that she's probably not doing the right thing here. She wants to go to the big city, so to speak, where all the heathen live, but also all the fun people live. And she wants to just sort of have a good time and, and party, have a night on the town. And so naturally, Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, the prince of the land, sees her and he seizes her and lays with her and humiliates her. <clears throat> Now, of course, Hamor, or um, Shechem, the son of Hamor, he is the big shot in town. He can have his pick of the litter, so to speak. So, why would he not think that Dina would be honored to be with him? At least that's probably how he was thinking. And when he seizes her, the word there is... Some people think that what it means is he raped her, but I believe it's not so forceful. It's probably more like he persuaded her. She didn't want to, but he is like, he persuaded her in some way. So he seizes her is not like she's crying out and he for forces her down or whatever, but more like she was nervous, didn't want to do it, but she's out partying, and this guy who's the biggest shot in town is like, I want to lie with you, and he and she's like, well, you're uncircumcised, and that sort of thing. I still have these, these, uh, these, what do you call them? Man, it's early today. I, I'm thinking of a word, but I can't think of the word. Loyalties. Yeah, that's the word. Loyalties. She's loyal to her family and to her way of life and to her God, more or less. And so when he says that I want to lie with you, he's uh, she's not wanting to do that. That's going too far. But he convinces her. Maybe he does it in a forceful way. Maybe he's like, well, how are you going to get home, babe? I mean, I'm not going to let you go and that sort of thing. Eventually, she coalesces. That's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Eventually, she accepts and he lies with her. Most likely, it's not. It's probably more like sexual assault, not straight out rape. And a lot of people don't really understand the difference there. But either way, it was it was evil and and the wrong thing to do. But. It's not like it was violent rape. And that's a thing. And the Torah is actually a little nuanced on this issue. So he seizes her and, and humiliates her. And his soul was drawn to Dina, 
the daughter of Jacob, he loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with him, uh, his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. So Jacob, right now, when he when he says that he defiled her, um, that Shechem defiled Dinah, he's probably getting this account from Shechem, and so most likely it's skewed. It's like she, uh, yeah, she said no at first. I seduced her, and now we're in love. So I want to marry her. That sort of thing. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to see Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. Now, when they say such a thing must not be done, again, this is a holy nation, and they do not sleep with women unless they're, well, I mean, uh, um, Judah, he sleeps with Tamar, thinking he's a prostitute. So, in their mind, when you sleep with a woman, either she is your wife, or she's a prostitute. Those are the only options. You either get married to her first, and then you can sleep with her, or she's a prostitute. So this sort of thing must not be done. But Hamor speak, uh, spoke with him, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. So Hamor, he's saying, Okay, this is going to be good politically for all of us. You'll get more wealth. You're already wealthy. You'll get more. And I'm going to get what I want, the, the daughter, your daughter, for my son. And we'll be one people. Dw- um... um the land will be open to you. You, sh- you can dwell with it and trade in it and to get property in-, property in it. And Shechem also also said to her father and to her brothers, Let us find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and, and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. There's a dilemma. Many people don't think about this, but there's a dilemma here. When we read this story, especially in our modern mind, we we only think about the severity of what Shechem did to Dina. But now Hamor is introducing more into the equation. He's saying, if we do this, this land, I'm this is the capital city, I'm the king of this capital city. You'll be royalty in the capital city of Canaan. There's a temptation there, not just being royalty, but in the potentiality of fulfilling the promise of God to Jacob here. How is Jacob going to gain the land? From his brother Esau. His brother Esau is a mighty hunter. He's mighty. Jacob isn't a military man. But if he has the might of the capital of Canaan behind him, all of the confederacy of Canaan behind him, he might be able to win. Not only that, but these people are willing to get circumcised, so they're not technically going to be foreigners. Will he get circumcised and also learn our ways? Learn the commandments of God? Forsake all of their gods? Maybe. So, if they become like us, and they become us, then actually they're going to become Israelites. And then what God said to Abraham, you'll be the father of many nations. Jacob, his 12 sons, 12 tribes, that's one nation. Shechem, that's another nation. You're already getting multiple nations. You're going to be the father of many nations, and all this land will be yours Dina being now royalty, the king of all this land that God gave to, or the queen of all this land that God gave to uh, Abraham. Her son, also the son, or the, the grandson of Jacob, is going to inherit all of it. And it doesn't take all that much 
let's say, the death of Shechem to, uh, for all the property to go to her or to her brothers. The temptation is there's a high possibility that this is providentially what, how God is going to fulfill his promises to Jacob, to Abraham and Isaac. How is Jacob to know that that's not how it's going to happen? The problem is, if the people get circumcised, are they actually Israelites? Meaning, if they're physically circumcised, but their heart's not circumcised, are they actually Israelites? There's a, there's a question for them. The temptation is, they'll be Israelites, and therefore they will... They'll be like us, and, and we will gain the promise of God in our lifetime. And the whole prophecy of God that, that they're going to dwell in a foreign land for 400 years, we don't have to do that. We can do it now. But then the question is, is their heart going to be circumcised? The answer to that is no. No. And so it's not just the wealth. It's actually the temptation of fulfilling the promise of God in the power, uh, in our own power. And that's a real temptation that every single one of us face every day. Now the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dina. They said to them, uh, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. And they've already been disgraced. And he's like, are you going to add insult to, in, to, to injury? Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Circumcision was a sign of... It was a sign of culture, of sophistication, of cleanliness, at least to the Canaanites at this time. I know later we talked about like the Romans and the Greeks and how it was a sign of barbarism um, to them, but to the Egyptians, they actually circumcised their uh, children right before they got married or when they reached adulthood. It was a sign of becoming a man in a civilized society. Now, the Canaanites were the more barbarian-esque tribes didn't see it that way. It was strange. The, the, it, it was seen as unmanly, so to speak. Why are you cutting off a piece of your penis? At the same time, it was uh, like if you read ancient Egyptian texts, there's this one story, I forgot the details, but there's this official who is the, the vizier the second in command, the cupbearer, to this pharaoh. And then this pharaoh dies, and his son, either his son or his brother, is going to take his place. And there's an issue because this cupbearer doesn't know if this new son, this new pharaoh, is going to treat him well. There's actually a high probability that this new pharaoh is going to put him to death. And so he runs over to the Canaanites. And it's interesting the way that they um, describe the Canaanites. They described them as being rough, murder, murderous bandits who grow their beards out, among other things. Hmm. So what the Canaanites did that the Egyptians did not do is grow their beards out. This is another thing. And you have a bunch of these Israelites who are coming in, and they also have their beards grown out. They're just like the Canaanites in that way, but they also circumcise themselves. They're just like the Egyptians in that way. So how is this going to be reconciled? Like, you're like us, but you're like them? Well, it turns out in the Israelite religion, growing your beards out is a, is a sign of honor. Just like for a woman, growing her hair out in the New Testament is a sign of honor. In 
Israelite faith, a man growing his beard out is a sign of honor. And we know this because there's a story of David's uh, in in the time of David where he sent two um, two messengers out to a Midianite king after his father died, and he's going to give condolences. And this Midian, Midianite king thinks that they're spies and humiliates them by shaving half of their beard and um, cutting their tunics at the 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 height of their butt. And what happens is when they come back, David is, of course, humiliated and he goes to war with Midian and he tells the people, hide yourself, shave your beard and hide yourself until you, until your beard grows back. It was seen as a dishonorable and so much that so much so that you can't even show your face if you have your beard shaved. And so to this, these Israelites, having a full beard is like, that's a manly thing. That's an honorable thing. And so they're, they're like the Canaanites in this respect. At the same time, of course, circumcision is part of being a member of the covenant people. Like if, you don't, if you're not circumcised, you're not even part of the covenant is how they thought of it and so they're saying okay well you already have the beards get circumcised you'll be part of the covenant and we'll be good of course they say this deceitfully because the answer to the question of whether or not it's only circumcision of the flesh or if you have to have circumcision of the heart and the flesh is answered the answer to the question is revealed no you have to have circumcision of the heart first and then the circumcision of the flesh that follows the circumcision of the heart the reason that they're all getting circumcised is deceitful as we hear they said uh, he did not delay this thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter and now he was the most honored of all his father's house so Hamor and his son Jacob came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying these men are at peace with us let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Pretty good so far. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. Still good. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Still good, but then it turns. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. So the reason that all the people are getting circumcised, are entering the covenant, so to speak, is so that they can gain the property of the Israelites. They're not trying to be part of the covenant people. They're not like Ruth, who says, "My, uh, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. They're saying, if we can trick them into thinking that we're part of their family, then all of their property will be ours. We'll get it all. And so circumcision of the heart must precede circumcision of the flesh. That's the answer to the question. All the way back here. Um, if you're not circumcised in the heart and you're circumcised in the flesh, you're not part of the covenant. Because it's not circumcision of the flesh alone that gets you part of the covenant. Even here, originally, in the time of Jacob, it's circumcision of the heart, meaning holiness. You have to love God. You have to be in a relationship with him. You have to have faith in him. And then circumcision comes as part of the covenant people. And that's the answer. So these people who circumcised themselves were not part of the covenant just because they circumcised themselves. Their heart was not faithful. Therefore, they never were part of the covenant. And so all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now on the third day when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. So Dina has been there this whole time. She's basically a captive. 
Oh, here's another thing. So there's another question here about whether Dina was was raped or seduced. And if she was seduced, what the Torah says is, okay, she was seduced. She is a very terrible situation, but the answer to seduction is marriage. It's not the death penalty. That's what the Torah says. If a woman, even though she's tricked, even though um, she's coerced in some way, sl sleeps with a guy, but there's no sign that uh, of like violence, then you can't just implicate the guy on her word alone. You'll have to have witnesses. You'll have to have a variety of other things. Only on, uh, on uh, by the mouth of two or three witnesses can a person be executed anyway. And the penalty for rape is execution. So if you can't execute this guy because he's not, you know, there, there's not enough proof for, that he's a rapist, then what do you do? Well, we don't know if he's a rapist. She never screamed out. So at the time, we, don't, we can't tell if it was like bad decision on her part. We don't know any of these details. Um, so what do we do? Well, she's also been defiled now. Meaning, in the culture, as a bride, she can't get as much of a bride price. She might not even be able to get married. She could possibly become a concubine, but nobody wants that for their daughter. So, the best we can do is, okay, force this guy to marry her. And pay not just the bride price, but pay an exorbitant amount more. Like, a vast amount more than the bride price. Okay, and this bride price goes to her protection. So um, what he took from her, he's now giving 10 to 100 times what he, what he would have if he only waited and asked her to marry him in the first place. So the Torah's answer to that situation, which is tricky, is not to say, well, she says it was rape, therefore we only listen to her. The Torah's answer is, we don't know. Rape is, is an execution. It's a capital offense. If it was rape, then he dies. But only on the best available evidence can we put someone to death. So therefore, because we can't put him to death, and because she has been um, defiled, and there's a very small likelihood that she'll be able to get married in this culture, the best thing that we can do is force the guy to marry her. Now, there's a caveat here. He has to pay the father regardless whether he marries her or not but if let's say she tells the father that it was rape even though there's not enough witnesses the father understands this and he can tell him that he's not going to allow them to marry now what does this mean he pays him i think i forgot what the equivalent was but it was like tens of thousands of dollars in today's dollars which, you know, take it or leave it. But now he's now she's protected from him. And of course, this is just the base rulings in the Torah. The rabbis have added a variety of other rulings that add more protections for uh, for this woman. But that's the basic understanding of what the Torah says in this particular situation. The other option is if he raped her, he gets put to death. So Jacob, what he's saying is this, there's not enough evidence that this was rape. We, we just, there's no way to, to prove it. So therefore, we have to either let her remain unmarried or allow her to be married to this guy and have him pay a significant bride price. So he's saying there's not enough evidence that it was rape. Let's, let's allow the marriage. The, the brothers are saying, you're just ignoring the evidence because obviously it would be rape because we know our sister. You don't pay enough attention to her. We know her. So we're going to say it's rape. So therefore the punishment is death. And we're going to take justice into our own hands because the, the chief justice in the land, which is Jacob, is not doing his job.
Now, if it was not justified what they did, then it would be murder, and they would be put to death. The, the two sons, Levi and Simeon. But there's enough evidence in Jacob's mind that Shechem actually did what he did in a violative way. So he's saying, well, you're justified in putting him to death at the same time. So I'm not going to exact any punishment after this. Of course, this is all a little an anachronistic because the Torah was given later. But if we are sort of applying those rules into this situation, and this situation in the Torah is used as a case study of justice, because that's how the Torah works. It, all the stories are case studies, and then the laws are, are prescriptive rules. They're principles that you build off of. Then this is a case study, and we apply the laws to it. This is a very difficult case study because it's very nuanced, it's hard to tell, and you have multiple justices coming at this from multiple angles, some a little more close to the actual victim here, and some uh, a, little, a little more reserved. And what the Torah is saying is, Levi and Simeon, they weren't entirely justified, but it wasn't murder what they did, because they were justified enough. They were the kinsmen redeemers in this sense. And although they defile the land for this action, and although they do get punished later in a more symbolic way because Jacob, uh, his blessing towards Levi and Simeon is that uh, he separates them and um, uh, sort of passes over them for the firstborn blessing. Although that's the case, they are seen as the kinsman redeemer in this sense. And if you're not familiar with that term, the kinsman redeemer is the one who redeems the honor of, of his closest kin that has been shamed. Whether that's murder, somebody who's murdered, their honor is shamed in some way, so they go after the murderer. They are the ones to... It, the Torah says that it's the next of kin that puts the murderer to death if he's found guilty. If somebody kills somebody on accident, they have to run to get to the city of refuge. The kinsman redeemer chases them, and they might catch them and put them to death, and the kinsman redeemer, although he is not entirely justified in this because vigilante justice is, is wrong, it's also that they're not a murderer. And you're like, well, they just killed a guy, like, beyond the justice system. And you're like, yeah, but they're also not a murderer. These guys just killed his brother, and he doesn't know whether or not it was murder. But he's angry enough to exact this justice, this justice, so to speak. But it still defiles the land. And then if, if they camp around the city, and they find out that the one who killed them before their trial exits the city they're perfectly justified in killing that guy, more or less. And so, Levi and Simeon are the kinsmen redeemers of Dina. And there are a variety of other things. The next of kin, the kinsmen redeemer, also will, it's their responsibility to get their, their sibling or son or whatever out of debt. If they sell themselves into slavery, it, then they have to, they have to pay for that person to get out of slavery. So, I mean, there are a variety of, of things that the kinsman redeemer does. And we also see the example of Abraham going and fighting the five people. That was a kinsman, or when they, when they captured Lot, that was a kinsman redeemer action. So, Simeon and Levi are acting as kinsman redeemer here. So, that means that although their killing defiles the land and is not entirely justified, it's not considered murder at the same time, according to the Torah. And that's what this case study tells us as case law. Even though it's a bit anachronistic to um, apply the Torah to these people, it's not anachronistic in the fact that Moses wrote this story down for the people of Israelite as a companion to the Torah. I mean, these stories aren't just nice stories that Moses is giving them. Every, I mean, there are like 
a ton of things that happen in the lives of these people. The question is, why did he write these stories down? They're part of the myth. But, like, what myth does this, what does this provide for an Israelite after they exit Egypt? It's case study. It's case law. Not only does it tell us the difference between a, the circumcision of the heart and the flesh, but it also tells us the difference between seduction and, mer and rape and which parties are justified in their decision to do whatever they did. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob... Oh, wait, so we already went over that. They killed all the people and took their wealth and took their uh, little ones and their wives, and they plundered it. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, Should, we, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So there's that theme again. you either married to her when you sleep with her, or she's a prostitute. Those are the only options. And prostitute, of course, is a dishonored woman. A married woman is an honored woman. So either she's honored, she's dishonored. There's no in between there. Now the question here, the question here is, does God disapprove of the actions of Simeon and Levi? Now this may seem like a foreign, uh, a foreign concept here but if you read any ancient text like if you read the texts let's say the the plays of sophocles or aeschylus or anyone you'll see this underlying system of justice where if you defile a, a particular land through murder especially if it's a divine land and jacob believes that this this land that is being given to him is divine, it's God's land, then the gods will fight against you. You could defile a piece of land as a mighty army, and it will only take a couple guys to come in and, and assassinate the person who did it, or get rid of everybody, like kill them all. So Jacob here sees this as an unjust killing, the question is, is God now going to fight against him and his family? It has, has God's protection left him because of this unjust killing? The answer is no. We see later that the fear and dread of the Israelites fell upon all the inhabitants, which means God's protection was still on the Israelites here. And it means that what, what Simeon and Levi did was not considered an entirely unjust action because God is still protecting them. And that's all I have to say on that story. But it's a really fascinating story. Um, I think people sort of gloss over it. They oversimplify it by saying it's, especially if you're like the atheistic type, and you're, you, you say, oh, well, this is just another instance of injustice in the Bible. But it's not really. It's a complex, uh, it's complex case law. It's very nuanced case law explaining what the Torah actually says on the difference between rape and seduction and the consequences of both and it's it explains not only when you get a situation like this where it's very difficult to actually adjudicate on it what the parties are justified in doing okay let's continue genesis 35 God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. 
So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that, that are among you, and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that, he, that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So she called its name Elon Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padanaram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall your name be. Hmm. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured it oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken to him, Bethel. Then he journeyed from Bethel when, when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Noni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob whom, uh, who were born to him in Padanaram. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were a hundred and eighty years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now this is an interesting story here. So, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So he's returning to Bethel. He's returning there from Shechem. So, uh, let me pull up a map, actually, because this is kind of important. If it'll load... Ancient Seir and Israel is what I looked up for last week. It's loading very slow for some reason. Let's see, does this have... No, okay. Okay, okay, where's Shechem? Where's Shechem? I wonder if this will show it. Nope, I don't want Etsy. Will that? No, no. That's not going to show it. Now, of course, Shechem is 
if I remember right, Shechem is actually in Israel. So, ah, oh man, this is... Why is this loading so terribly? Let's go here. Okay, Shechem, yep. Shechem is part of Israel, so Jerusalem would be about right here. Shechem is here, so it's just north of where Jerusalem is. It's north of Jericho, um, so it's within the land of Israel. Now, Padan Aram is, like, way up here. So, Bethel, where's Bethel? Um... Oh, man, now I have to find Bethel. Bethel is also just north of Jerusalem. So here's Judea, here's Bethlehem. Bethel would be... Where is it? Right there. So Jerusalem is here, Bethel is right up here. And we just saw that Shechem is way up here. And Padan Aram is like 500 miles to the northeast. That's a bit of a difference. So when, when God says here, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, make an altar there to the God, he's, talk, he's saying go south. But not that far south. Just go a few, a few miles south. And Jacob said to his household and all to, who are with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. Okay, now there are a variety of interpretations of where all these foreign gods came from. Either maybe they came from all the women and children that they just took from Shechem. I mean, that would make sense. They're putting it under the terebinth tree of that that's near Shechem. And terebinth trees were like sacred trees. In the Abrahamic faith, a terebinth tree is a sacred tree. So he's saying, bury them under the, the, the tree of God, meaning God has dominion over them and he's going to basically decompose them. So that's one um, interpretation. Another interpretation that secular um, scholars like is that this is evidence that it, Jacob, Israel, they still maintain some form of polytheism at this point. Like, yeah, the God of the Bible is like the one big king God, but, you know, there are a bunch of other smaller gods. I think if you're just going with the biblical narrative, it could, it, it's just as easy one way or the other but because of the context here because the chapters actually are are not there in the original text it's most likely it's just all the people from Shechem that have brought their foreign gods and he's saying okay well now you're part of Israel all your, all your sons, daughters, and, and your wives so um, you're no longer going to worship those gods they're gone our God delivered you into our hands so naturally, he also destroyed all your gods. All your do all your gods are dead. They won't hear you. Get rid of them. Bury them under the tree of our god. And as they so as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So again, that's the answer to the question: Did they did God's favor leave them after this incident? And the answer is no. And then they came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. Now, both of these places are in the land of Canaan, but, you know, it's just telling us, I suppose. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So she called its name Elan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padanaram. Okay, so now, now, okay, how is this happening? He came from Padanaram. So what's, okay, let's go back to the map here. Here's Bethel. Here's Shechem. Padanaram is way up, like 500 miles northeast. Did he come from Shechem down like, I don't know, 10 miles or so? 
to, sh- to uh, where is it, Bethel? Maybe that's like 20 or 30 miles. No, like this is like seven miles here. So, yeah, that's like just a couple miles. He went from Shechem and down to Bethel. Okay, seven miles. And now he's coming from Padanaram. That's all the way up north. No, that, I, I, I don't understand. So Shechem, down to Bethel, all the way up to Badonaram, now back to, down to Bethel. I don't know. Uh, an, uh, that's one way of reading that. Another way of reading that is this is a reiteration of a previous story. It's a summary because right after this, they're talking about the deaths of all these people. It's going into an entirely new story. So this perhaps is a summary of the events that have transpired so far. So God appeared to Jacob again when he, when he came from Padanaram. Okay. Again, is that talking about after the Shechem incident or is that talking about, is again talking about Jacob's ladder up to Padanaram. The angel of God appears to him, says, I'm God and that sort of stuff. That story that's appearing again. And then he comes down and appears to him again. And this is Jacob wrestling with the angel. Is that the God that's being uh, um, uh, appearing to him? That's a possibility because that's the time when he blesses him and he says, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall your name be. That's, that's a possibility. So he called his name Israel and God said to him, now, if that is the case, then this is adding more context to either that was the summary and now it's continuing with the current story. God said to him the second time that he comes to Bethel and built an altar there, I am God Almighty, be fruitful, multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you and I will give the land to your offspring after you. That's possible. Um, Or is this adding additional context to what the angel said to Jacob before he left? Regardless, I think that that second paragraph, that second blessing is a return to the current setting. Because it says, Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. Now God just told him to go down to Bethel and build an altar there. And this pillar is an altar. It's an additional altar that, um, uh, in addition to the one that Jacob already set up for God after the whole Jacob's ladder incident. So God went up from him in the place where he had spoken to him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. It's very possible that this is sort of chiastically going backwards in events. You have him appearing to him after Padanaram, then going back to the Jacob's Ladder event. And because Jacob set up a pillar there, poured oil and a drink offering onto it before. Well, I I don't think he actually poured a drink offering on it, but he poured oil on it. So is it adding more context? That's one of the questions. No, I don't think so. Now, here's the kicker. If you're a Jewish person and you read this story, you're saying that Jacob came down, then went back up to Padanaram, and then came down again. This is a second time that God is blessing Jacob, or a second time that the blessing is being given to Jacob. If you're a Christian and reading this, maybe that's what you're thinking. God is giving this blessing a second time. Maybe you're also thinking that this is just a summary of the previous story. And then it's coming back to the current scene um, in verse 11. What's the answer? I don't know. It could probably go either way. Um, regardless, I think one of the important things that we learn here is that God himself, now this is again one of those things that people, the anti-Semites, 
uh, they'll say against the modern Jews is that it wasn't like the blessing was given to Abraham. So any descendant of Abraham actually has a claim on the land of Israel. So if you're an Ishmaelite, so to speak, you have a claim to the land of Israel. That's the claim. But here, that's not what happens. God says to Jacob that the land that I'm giving to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and to your offspring after you. This is not the Midianites or, or this is not Ishmael. And so God built, built or Jacob built an altar unto God in Bethel. So then they, then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said, said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni. And this is another reason why I think Rachel was a little more self-centered than, let's say, Leah. Because she's like, what's the parting gift I'm going to give to my son? I'm going to call him... What, what is it? Son of my sorrow. And so his father changed his name and said, I'm going to call him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Potentially. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over, the, over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Adair. So Bethlehem is a Rachel city later, which is an interesting... Well, we'll get into that later. But she's not buried in the, the patriarch's tomb like Leah, Rebecca, and Sarah are, which is another evidence that Rachel was a little bit more of a wild card, a black sheep of the family. So while Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. This is a short little story, but what does it mean when people do this? Okay, well, let's go back. Who is Bilhah? Bilhah is Rachel's maidservant. So Reuben is trying to become the quote-unquote... There are two things that, that are happening here. One, Reuben is trying to assert... Uh, to subvert the authority of his father to, to take it. He's the firstborn after all, and he wants to be king now. And that's what happens when a son who is in line for the throne in the ancient world, when they lie with the concubines or with the wives of his father, who is the king. He's trying to take over. And two, he's trying to assert authority over, over Rachel's sons. And of course, this backfires. He never gets the firstborn right again. Reuben doesn't. And in fact, later on, he doesn't even enter the land. Like, he enters the land, but he gets his inheritance outside of the land, even though it, the it, an inheritance inside the land was offered to him. So... And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, at, at, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. And Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people. So, a little bit of math here. Isaac was 30 when he married Rebekah. After, what was it, 20 years... He had the twins, Jacob and Esau. So now he's 50. And after 60 years, Jacob leaves. That whole thing happens. So he is 111 by the time 
Jacob leaves, so naturally he's 100 and level uh, and 11. He thinks he's going to die soon. So all that stuff is happening. He is blind for 70 years. He lives another 70 years after he gives the blessing over to Jacob and, and Esau, thinking he's going to die soon. And then Esau vows to kill Jacob after he dies, which he thinks is not going to be that far away. But he lives another 70 years. So by the time Jacob goes to Badanaram, dwells there for 20 years and comes back, Isaac is 130. He still has another 50 years to, to live. I just think that's crazy. It's a little bit of funny trivia, but yeah, let's move on. We'll do just part of this one here. This is mostly generations. So we'll run through this. Genesis 36. These are the generations of Esau. So this is the myth of Esau. That is Edom. So where does Edom come from? Well, the Israelites need to know this because Esau is their brother and they don't want to just attack Edom because Edom is has a right to be, let's say, in a dwelling in the tent of Jacob. Edom has a right to do that as their kin. Esau took his wife from the Canaanites, Adah, the daughter of Elan the Hittite, Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basimoth, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. And Adah bore to Esau Eliphaz, Basimoth, uh, Basimoth bore Reuel, and Aholibama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob. So, first of all, he's like, come, Jacob, follow me to this land and sit here. And Jacob's like, no. And now he's like, well, this land is given to Jacob. Isaac is dead. Now Jacob owns all the land. So I'm going to go away. For their possessions were too great for them to, to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Basimoth, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omer, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Uh-oh. Now, wait, let's see. Eliphaz bore Timon. Wait, 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 wait. Timnah was... Okay, wait, okay, okay, okay. Eliphaz was born of Adah. Eliphaz was a... Con uh, uh, took a concubine, Timnah, and Timnah and Eliphaz bore Amalek. Now, here's a little bit of timeline here. That is one generation. <laughs> That's two generations. Amalek was probably very old by the time Moses was coming out of Egypt. But that's not 400 years old. That is one, two generations. Now, if you look at the generations of the Israelites as they're in the land of Egypt, it's like three or four generations. So when Paul later, I think it's in Corinthians, he talks about how, uh, where the 400 years comes from. He says from the time where God um, gives the prophecy to Abraham to the time when they were, come out of the land. That is 430 years. So they, they don't dwell in Egypt for 400 years. They dwell in Egypt for maybe 180 years at most. It's not that long. It might even be less, but it's like three or four generations. Um, and, and well, Timnah and Eliphaz, they have to have a son pretty late in order for Amalek to be attacking Moses as they exit the land of Egypt. So, possibly, 
Timnah and Eliphaz, they bore, um, uh, well, Esau bears Timnah, uh, bears Eliphaz. He probably is really old by the time he marries Timnah, let's say 60 years, something along those lines. And then they have a son, Amalek. Now that's still too far. So we have to put Eliphaz's uh, bearing uh, or Eliphaz's having Amalek even later. So let's say the uh, Eliphaz marries Timnah. Timnah's a concubine. Eliphaz first marries another wife and they can't have children. So then this other wife gives Timnah to Eliphaz in the typical way that you do things. But let's say that is, I don't know, 20 years later. So Eliphaz has this other wife. He gets married to her and she can't bear a child. They wait 20 years because he loves her. Um, so he has a child first when he's like 80. Okay. Now, Amalek is 80 attacking Moses. Potentially. This, this, this kind of, like... This gives us a little bit of the timeline. It limits the timeline of Egypt. Now, all of that speculation, but like, it's interesting to say to say the least, in my opinion. These are the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These are okay. These are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shamash, and Miza. These are the sons of Basimoth, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Olibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chief of Timon. So this is where the documentary hypothesis like thrives because it's like, okay, okay. First few verses you get, these are the, the generations of Esau. Okay. Verse nine, these are the generations of Esau. Again, like what? Okay. Verse 15, these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, again. So you're like, okay, well, what does this mean? The documentary hypothesis is that these are actually three different lists, and they were scribed down by three different groups of people, and eventually the, the redactor took all of them, and instead of sort of weaving them together, he's just like, I don't care about Esau, slaps them all on one page. That's the documentary hypothesis for you. So these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs of Teman, Omer, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the chief. Oh, so Amalek is the youngest. So if he started having children at like 80, and then he has Teman, Omer, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gilam, and Amalek, it's like, okay, let's say you put five years in between them. So Teman... 80, Omer, 85, Zephyr, uh, Zepho, 90, Kenaz, 95, Korah, 100, Gatam, 105, and Amalek, 110. So he's 110, okay. <laughs> These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Reuel, Esau's sons. Uh, the chiefs of Nahath, whoops. Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Reuel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, the chiefs of Jeush, Jalash, uh, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chief, chiefs born of Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. Now, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan. So why are we learning this? Well, most likely... Esau didn't just conquer them, he just, he married into them, and, because uh, this is the place that he um, inhabited. So these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Ana, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timna. Oh, that's how we get Timna. So Eliphaz married Timnah after they went into Seir. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, 
Aya and Anna, he is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness. Nice guy. As he pastured the donkeys of Zibion, his father. These are the children of Anna, Dishon and Holibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Keran. Keran. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhah, Zava, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. So you can, okay, if you are a redactor, like you can read this very much with the documentary hypothesis. You're the redactor, you find all these lists it's is very much what like people like Eusebius did or other Greek historians who took a bunch of genealogies and put them all together and tried to match them and stuff the redactor finds all these genealogies of Seir and Edom and Israel and they're like okay how did these all fit bam Timnah is in both of these they're married okay that's how that happened and that's the connection between Seir and Edom and so that's why it's giving us the genealogy of of the chiefs of, of the Horites. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom, before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Din Haba. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Husham, of the land of the Temanites, reigned in his place. Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned in his place, the name of his city being Avith. Hadad died, and Samla of Masreka reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth of the Euph Euphrates reigned in his place. Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, the son of Achbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his place, the name of his city being Pau. His wife's name was uh, Mehetebel, the daughter of Met, uh, Matred, daughter of Mezahab. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places by their names. The chiefs Timna, Alva, Jetheth, Olibama, Elah, Pinon, Kenaz, Teman, Biz, uh, Miz, uh, Mibzar, Magdiel, and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is, Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possessions. That's interesting. This last list gives the names of chiefs and names Esau's wives as chiefs. If that's not interesting to you, it is to me. And you know what that says? Esau, having ad uh, adopted and adapted a lot of the customs of the other people, that he married said that the concubines, these matriarchs, are chiefs. They ruled over cities. So, Edom, Seir, all that land, these people were Canaanites or um, uh, Ishmaelites. There was a Hittite, a Canaanite, and an Ishmaelite that, that Esau married. That tells us that at least one of those three people had a quasi-matriarchal, quasi-patriarchal system. Or perhaps one of those three was a matriarchal system. Esau was in a patriarchal system, that is the Israelite system, and he decided to combine the two and make it a matriarchal-patriarchal system. Now what do we know? The Hittites... We're not, or we're not matriarchal. We don't know much about Canaanites. Potentially they were patriarchal, but it could be that they were matriarchal. What about the Ishmaelites? We don't know. They were Egyptian. Ishmael, the only person that he would have seen as his, like, Parent, parental figure was Tamar or I mean Hagar very much could have been that he saw Hagar as like the top person in his kingdom he could have been uh, his society could have been 
very much a matriarchal society. And I think, uh, if I remember right, Ishmael, um, down the line, they became a uh, moon cult and star cult, and their chief deities was one uh, moon goddess and three daughters, the, the star goddesses. So very much could have been a, a matriarchal society. And if Ishmael, being the closest of kin to Esau in the three people that he married, was matriarchal, then he's like, okay, well, that guy, that culture is the most likely to, to uh, for me to adopt. But I'm patriarchal because of my father. So therefore, let's just mix the two. Therefore, now this is all hypothetical. This is a little bit um, off the cuff here. But... The names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places, by their names, Timnah, a woman, Alva, a man, Jetheth, a man, Aholibama, a woman, Elah, a man, Pinon, a man, Kenaz, a man, Teman, a man, I think Teman was a man, or Teman might have been a woman, Mibzar, a man, Migdiel, a man, and Iram, a man. You have two women in this list of of how many uh, however many people as chiefs that's interesting at the very least and what this also tells us is that Edom being some uh, uh, the kin of Jacob and having certain blessings and being connected to Israel at least in theory hypothetically was seen as, like, his system of government was not a bad system of government. It just wasn't perfect. So, I mean, it could very well be that God was okay with these female chiefs. And we do see echoes of that in the Old Testament. I don't know. I just find that interesting. But, with that, I think um, I will leave. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or, I don't know, just something, uh, if you find those genealogies as interesting as I found them, leave a comment. And whatever the most interesting thing was in this set of biblical uh, passages and stories, let me know. And, uh, yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your week. Shalom. Shalom.